Global supply chains today are seeing challenges on a massive scale, raising questions as to whether or not basic principles of these supply chains can respond to the growing challenges of the 21st century. The devastating impact of COVID-19 resulted in regulatory measures such as quarantines and travel bans, which severely impacted labor worldwide, not to mention the ongoing challenges of today's labor market. Here to further discuss what these challenges mean and the opportunities presented with emerging scalable supply chain technology is our very diverse panel. Kathy Hotka, Retail Insider, Greg Busek, President of IHL Group, and Jeff Roster, producer and co-host of This Week in Innovation and former tech analyst. Welcome, everybody. Hey, it's great to be here, Susan. Hi, dear. Hi. Good to see you all. I'll, I'll start by just asking this first question. I know you all know each other well, and there's no mm -hmm. doubt that many companies have been facing supply chain challenges, such as labor shortages and impacts from COVID-19, and now heavy inflation. Are there any yep. new or emerging challenges that retailers are facing today that you might comment on? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with this. I think the, the big issue that is not being talked about right now uh, quite a bit is a threat to the back to school season that we're seeing because of the port shutdowns in China due to COVID. Um, it typically takes about 50 days for product on average right now to get from the port in China to an actual warehouse or store within the United States if it's going through the ports of Long Beach or LA. It's 36 days average across the ocean. It's about seven and a half days to get on the rails. Then the, then the trucks need to get it and it's got to be taken across there. The problem that we have right now is there's a big glut because the port was shut down uh, in Shanghai and one of four shipping containers in the world is sitting empty off the coast of China right now. And at some point that is going to move over here. So that merchandise, if it's not already on the water or already in port, is not going to make it in time for back to school season. But it is all going to hit for September and October. So there will be discounts that come there. So you've got these this out of stock overstock thing that is just simply massive because of these port shutdowns that are completely the retailer has no control over those issues. And that's the biggest challenge. And it's not being talked about right now. What's been talked about is inflation and the issues of cost. And, hey, we missed the spring schedule for some things there. But this back to school season is going to be a pretty big hit as well. Yeah, that's incredible. But Kathy or Jeff, any comments you want to add on that same topic? I'll just say that uh, giving the oil industry a blank check probably wasn't such a smart idea. That happened three weeks ago. Uh, and so the rising price of uh, petroleum products, even though the price of uh, crude oil has remained the same, has been uh, devastating to the economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Greg, do you have a bet on uh, whether, whether LA strikes or not, the port strikes? I, you know, I'm not close. I haven't looked at that enough to, to know. Um, if it does, that just makes things even worse. I, I, yeah. I guess I'm not in their in their head. I, I don't know enough of the issues right now. I, I will tell you that LA and Long Beach has made huge strides from where we've been, um, just huge in the amount of uh, efficiency that they've added to things there. Now, um, hopefully they got some vacation time uh, during this lull because that, like I said, the hog and the snake is coming across the ocean again, and we're gonna have backups again uh, there, so. Thank you, Greg. Uh, so our next question, I'd love to ask you about um, digital innovation. Uh, many retailers have accelerated their digital innovation and deployment these last couple of years to mitigate some of the supply chain and inventory challenges that we've seen. What are some best practices and technologies um, that brands and retailers can implement to further address these issues? Kathy, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, I think the main thing we see retailers doing is uh, abandoning a lot of legacy technology and going into the cloud, uh, particularly multi-cloud environments. It's providing uh, all kinds of advantages to stores to be able to use new technologies. Uh, it reduces costs. It reduces complexity. It also increases uh, data security because somebody's constantly not having to re-up a patch for software. So that whole, whatever you want to call digital transformation, it's ongoing everywhere. Yeah, and I would add to that, if you're not doing computer-aided ordering, you're missing out because right now, 
it is competition for that inventory, just like we saw in the very beginning of the um, of the pandemic. What what happened is people were getting like, hey, you need to order 40 times the amount of uh, of toilet paper that you normally order. And the system told you this is what you got to do. And then some human being comes in and says, that's got to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And they press the button and cancel the order. And it's, it's that beginning to trust the data. Now, one of the things that's happened in the pandemic is I, I always like to joke that a lot of retailers are run in their inventory department by people that kind of went to the side of school where math wasn't required. It was more gut feel um, type thing. My, my sense of style, my sense, of, you can't operate that way anymore because these changes that occurred, like you said, Jeff was talking about the potential, the strike. You gotta be able to pivot off of that if, if, if something like that happens or you have the, the port shut down in Shanghai. Uh, you've got to be able to make quick decisions and that requires getting to much better relationships with your suppliers and understanding hey, what is it that you're going to make. Um, I heard a stat about grocery stores that just boggled my mind that 80% of SKUs in a grocery store sell less than one a week. So you have this proliferation of all these varieties of jello and pudding and spices and all this sort of stuff that don't need to be on the shelf. Well, you go to your manufacturer. What are you making? Because um, what's happening is this, it's not a matter of my system telling me how many I should order. I put the order in it's, and for a thousand and the manufacturer comes back. Great. You get 10. How do you, how do you manage that? And those are that, that, that relationship with your suppliers is what's so crucial. Yeah. Well, and look at the most giant retailers. They truly have a hands-off approach. They have, they have, analytics engines which are telling them what to do and that's what they do yeah yeah or they have the manufacturers de doing the inventory themselves right uh, and they offload it that way what i think is really interesting about that though kathy is um analytics engines are one thing but i think we're really about to see just a massive infusion of ai um i'm yes. looking at some survey data that that I'll be presenting in the next couple of weeks, um, developing an art now an artificial, not an analytics, but an, developing an artificial intelligence strategy. 23% of the respondents uh, of retailers worldwide say that's one of their top four initiatives over the next three years. That hopefully um, is a whole lot more powerful than what we've seen. And I absolutely agree about moving to the cloud that, that the numbers are just insane on that. Um, and I've had low code too. So I think what we're seeing is the evolution of a far, far more flexible, nimble, um, IT stack that will will be able to pivot a lot faster, as Greg was saying. I, I think it's a pretty exciting time to be looking at technology and retail. Yeah. It's first one to clean data wins because you that's a good line. I'm going to steal that. Yeah. Have you published that line? I'm going to steal that. Yeah, one. many. Yeah, multiple times. <laughs> oh, darn. <laughs> uh, you know, we've been we've been in this stage where it's been about uh, getting to uh, getting to accurate data, getting to clean day, data, providing our associates better tools, et cetera. And we've been in this stage. Right now, it's about using um, uh, whether it's RFID, computer vision technology, et cetera, to get to clean data so that forecasts can be better and can be acting quickly. And, and we're going to be in a situation very quickly where it's machine against man. And whoever gets to that clean data first wins. Because with artificial intelligence, you need tons of data, but it has to be clean and it has to be tagged properly. Um, and so when you have that, you can massively improve. Now, when you have these fluctuations like this in the supply chain, that, that settles things. But in normal times, prior to the pandemic, when that finally gets out, it's really, are you accurate? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting what Walmart did they, they did, they took out the Bossa Nova robots that were making two passes through their, through their system there. They put in cameras every eight feet that take a snapshot once an hour, and they, they upload that to the cloud for, for analysis. Well, they know based on sales volume that this shelf is gonna be empty by two o'clock if you don't have somebody out there. Whereas when they were doing computer vision by a robot twice a day, they were missing that sort of thing. So those are some of the changes in the advancements that are happening that are trying to get to that clean data. But right now it's all disrupted by the supply chain deltas and differentials there until that finally gets fixed 
um, we're not going to see the huge AI gains that we're talking about seeing. But when that does get fixed, it's game over if you have not made those investments in RFID and uh, computer vision in your stores to get that accurate data. So how have these supply chain issues impacted the customer experience and shopping journey um, when you think about uh, out of stocks, brand loyalty, personalization? Um, maybe comment a little bit on, on the impact we're seeing with the customer and, and what, what that means to their experience in the store or online. I'll well, you, yeah, yeah. Just, just very quickly, um, I love Ikea and there's no product. Just go there and attempt to buy a dresser. They don't exist. The sofas don't exist. Yeah, it, but it's every it's everywhere. Um, there, the average the average grocery store is in, in every aisle is out of stock at about forty seven SKUs per aisle in the center aisles right now. Um, that which is pretty astounding. But that customer experience is, in some respects, their expectations are, are a little bit lower. Of, of what's going to be in stock because they've kind of been browbeaten, you know, but that number of, that percentage of lost sales and the amount of that is huge. Um, anecdotally, um, there are certain retailers I won't even shop anymore. Um, just, I just won't go in there because I know, particularly if it's something on sale, no chance it's going to be in stock when, when I go there. So it's that kind of experience, but we're just about to start a study, a consumer study to get that specific data that you're asking, Susan, um, we probably in the next two weeks to ask consumers that specific question, has your trust in the brand changed? Uh, how many times do you give somebody a chance to fulfill things? Um, uh, what's the kiss of death? When we did this before, what we found out is, is you buy it online, you get the email that says, hey, your order's ready and you show up and it's not there. Once, if that happens, the relationship's over with the consumer. And, um, and, and how does that differ? Do you give the, the home improvement company uh, a much better pass and more, more chances than you do the grocery store or vice versa? Um, how, do you, how does that differ? And it's really fascinating to watch those consumer dynamics. But right now, people are buying online often because they just know their local stores are likely going to be out of those items um, or they don't have their sizes. Like I won't go, I won't try to buy shoes at a store. I just physically won't. I have a, I have a four wide foot. I just won't try because there's no way they're keeping my size in stock anywhere. And, um, and so I just go online uh, for that. But everybody's got that, you know, whether it's dress sizes, et cetera. Um, those, are, those are the big issues from customer experience right now that they're facing. Other comments on that question that Kathy or Jeff, you want to add? Well, I'll just mention the grocery store. So that's another one where you can, you know, hit the uh, hit the baby aisle and look what the formula situation is. There's a tampon shortage. I mean, there's you can go to certain parts of the store and there's just nothing there. Yeah, and you heard about the infant formula today. the The factory, the new factory that just opened back up, it's flooded. Right. Yeah. I heard that. <laughs> okay. So. Shifting gears a little bit, what, what is the benefit of having end-to-end -end visibility into the supply chain? How can connected data be used across the entire supply chain to help improve operations, inventory management, and the customer experience? So I'm the person who wrote the memo to the Macy's board of directors asking for money for RFID when they actually went live. They had written a memo, and it was full of real technical jargon. Uh, and so they said, would you mind taking a, an eyeball at this? And I said it back and I said, you probably won't like what I wrote, but basically what I said was, we can be out of men's size 34 underwear for a year because we only do uh, product counts once a year. You have to have that inventory visibility and you have to be able to communicate that accurately to customers, they expect it. Yeah, as well as the fact that it goes both ways. And most retailers are only thinking about it as what's my view to the supplier, but without considering what's the supplier's view to what's happening in your stores. And that is so crucial. And most people say it's all about me, uh, so to speak there. Um, and so I think that value of that, once again, that relationship with your suppliers 
hey, what are, you know, if you're going to, if I'm ordering a thousand and you're only sending me 10, what is it that you're making so that I can order the right thing and I can prepare my, my ads for that, my signage for that, et cetera, um, that relationship and, and making tighter relationships there. So consumers today are increasing the demand for sustainable products. They've come to expect it. Uh, they want their brands and the retailers they buy from that they love to implement sustainable practices, including sourcing, manufacturing, and distribution. What does it mean to have a resilient supply chain, resilient and sustainable supply chain? And how can brands and retailers build that into their operations? I'd offer that the supply chain goes a number of different ways. So it not only is from the inception of the product to the product going into the customer, it's from the customer to the end of its useful life. And millennials and Gen Z are very concerned about sustainability. They've seen the pictures of the you know, plastic water bottles bobbing on the ocean. Um, H&M just announced a line of compostable baby clothes because they think it will be popular with that audience. And brands are wise to do that kind of thinking, I think. I think, you know, you know with, with our research, uh, there's a, the vast majority of people think sustainability should be the right way to do business but I'm not willing to pay for it. You should be doing this as a brand because it's the right thing to do. Now that's tough in an inflationary environment like we have right now. The thing that we found is around the world, if you say sustainability in America, people will buy a brand or not buy a brand based on the word sustainability. Around the world, you have to define what it means. And once you define what it means, it, you know, it's environmentally friendly manufacturing, oh yeah. I'm all in for that. I'll pay for that. I'll buy that brand for that once you define it. But it's kind of like customer centricity in our, our industry for all those of us that have been here for a long time. It was about six or seven years before anybody quite figured out what did that actually mean. And that's where we are with sustainability, I think, in a lot of ways. Is we generally know it's good for the environment and, and stuff there. But when you start defining the, the underlying things under that and communicating that, you're far more likely to build that brand equity around this issue. Yeah, and it's a, it's a real challenge, I think. Um, I, I have an upcoming interview um, on This Week in Innovation with uh, a, young, a young person that's doing a sustainable store in Greenwich Village. So what they do is they, they everything you, you refill, so soaps, liquids, all that sort of stuff. Um, and in talking to her, um, she said her target market are moms and Gen Z girls. Um, that's a pretty tight market. Um, and you know, Greenwich Village, that, that's going to work, but I think the challenge is going to be, how do we, how do we expand beyond, um, a very tight, a uh, well-defined cohort, um, that, that, that's passionate about that. I also did an interview, um, a few months ago with Allegro, which what their shtick is, is to have, uh, really high tech bottles that, that, uh, you can use to refill and they're in target right now. So it's a super heavy um, tech in, um, input um, to drive that. Now the key is, will consumers want to buy a nondescript, um, a, you know, a quality liquid in a nondescript package yet to be determined. So retailers are talking and wrestling with that. And there's plenty of really interesting examples, but the question is gonna come back to, do we as consumers wanna buy um, our detergent, liquid, whatever, in a reusable bottle or you know a sustainable bottle or do we need to have all that packaging a logo and i would hope i think all of us hope yeah we would do that um yet to be determined i don't know those of us around in the 80s remember uh wholesale bins of you know nuts and <laughs> remember that stuff i remember those two Brock's years ago Brock's candy yeah. one of the funniest things ever is the fmi show on tuesday when uh, it was white collar, collar looting, you know, they did the whole Prox candy display was <laughs> destroyed and the Mother's Day cards would all go. It was it was hilarious. People were walking with Mrs. Fields cookie bags. It, it, it was hilarious. So, yeah. The, the open candies. Just to get it. That was, that was so easy. Kathy, two years ago, I used to buy my lentils in exactly that scenario. And then COVID came along. And so we went from a super sustainable, very, very efficient to now pack plastic everywhere you see so that one big bin has been now replaced with with tons of plastic and so you know it, it, the best laid plans of mice and men um you, you introduce um chaos into that and then we all have to respond i i hope we can get back to um me, me being able to scoop my three or four pounds of lentils in one one bag as opposed to buying five or six different tubs of the, the darn things somebody yeah, how, figure this out and innovate 
So I'm curious though, is how, how is the COVID experience because it's so ingrained in us that we got to wipe things down the whole, if we got rid of buffets and all that is taboo, um, is that kind of thing coming back? Uh, type of I, thing? Well, it personally is somebody that has a very big problem with buffets. I hope they don't come back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm talking about the candies and the lentils. Oh Sorry. yeah. Well, I want the lentils back. I'm, I'm ready for, I'm ready to, I'm ready for them immediately. But um, yeah. you know, I am watching that because it's just, it's just the amount of plastics. I mean, all of us know the amount of plastic we created in the last two years has just got to be yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. So that brings us to our last question. Uh, what trends do you see shaping uh, the future of the next five or so years? And what's your recommendation to retailers? I'd love for each of you to comment on this. I think it's a really important question as we look ahead to the, to the, the future uh, in terms of what we're gonna see. Somebody reminded me the other day that when I started the NRF CIO Council in 1996, I reached out to the CIO of the then most powerful retailer on earth, Sears Roebuck. <laughs> How quickly things change. My recommendation to every retailer is to be tech forward. Figure out as many of these technologies as you can and get out in front of them because others around you are doing it and you can be left behind. Yeah, we've had a, a once in a generation tech reset with uh, the move to online. So a pure play e-commerce company spends about 8% of revenue on IT. Uh, a pure play grocery, uh, excuse me, a, a full line grocery store had traditionally been about one to 1.2%. And so all of a sudden, everybody wants to buy their groceries online. We have this massive increase in, uh, in IT and that's not going away. And, and people are still increasing the number of items that they're buying online for some segments that never had an online presence before. So that means another $50 billion a year that's going into IT. If you haven't made that jump, you are way behind. And I think the answer for the next five years, it gets back to what I already said. The first one to clean data wins um, because it's that AI and machine learning that is gonna be attacking all those different data points and that's going to be the thing that differentiates the next decade. Yeah, so I'd, I'd very much echo what Kathy just said. Um, I think you need, if you're a retailer, you need to have a extremely nimble, agile IT infrastructure. I think it has to be 100% cloud-based. Um, you need to be thinking very, very seriously. Not thinking, you need to be doing a lot of AI right now. You need to be experimenting. And I think um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of low code. So when I look forward, I've always, for 20 years, I've always forecast IT spend. I think Greg probably has done the same, where it's always increase and increase and increase. And I, I agree with Greg 100%. The, the amount, the amount of, of, of spike we've seen is dramatic. But I would like to think we'd get to a point where um, the quality of an IT infrastructure is not designed, is not determined by the amount of, of percent to rev uh, spent, but it's on the, the the flexibility and the agility and how much do you have in infrastructure. If you're still spending 60% in infrastructure, you're, you're just doing it wrong. And so I think as we do this complete reset, we're, we're literally standing on the precipice of seeing a far, far more nimble, far more flexible, and, and hopefully uh, less expensive infrastructure. All, thank you all for your great insights and, and comments on this incredible challenge that we're facing in the marketplace right now. Really appreciate both your time and your creative uh, ideas and, and uh, insights into the supply chain challenges. Um, so I'd like to thank all the panelists for joining and it was a pleasure uh, to talk with you today. Thank you, Susan. Thank Thanks you so much.